so I differentiate between enterprise learning and educational learning. In the educational world, you as a high school teacher, you know that you teach people content. You want them to have knowledge and skills, but you don't know exactly what they're going to do with them when they get a job. But you're trying to prepare people for a career, a job, and all of that. Um, and, you know, other things in their personal lives as well. But but so, but in enterprise learning, we pretty much know what the job is that people have to do. And people are on the payroll not to uh, know topics, not to have knowledge and skills, not to have skilled behaviors, not to perform tasks, but they're on the payroll to perform tasks to produce outputs that meet stakeholder requirements. Their downstream customer has a requirement, whether that customer is internal or external to their organization. Uh, their management, their executives, the owners of the company, they have requirements. The government and regulatory agencies, they have requirements. Uh, the people that work around us have requirements. They don't want us to cause an accident and hurt other people or kill other people. So there's a whole bunch of, in the performance context, in an enterprise, we can pretty much look at that and decide, what is what are they trying to produce? Who is it for? Who are the other stakeholders? And what are their requirements for the output that's to be produced and for the process itself, the behavioral tasks, the cognitive tasks? What is important about that? And how can we provide learning to train people to give them instruction so that they can perform tasks to produce outputs to the stakeholder requirements? And I was taught this on day one. And I'm just, I was, I'm lucky because I realized that most people that entered into the field weren't orientated that way in the very beginning. And so my boss and my peer were able to take me to local chapter meetings for the professional society and people would show us their task analysis. And we would giggle because it looked like a random list of tasks. And there was no anchor to what are they doing those tasks for? The tasks are a means to the ends of producing an output, which itself is a means to somebody else's process and outputs. So, so I had this view, this orientation, and this orientation goes back into the 60s. And I learned it at the end of the 70s. And it had been 10, 15, almost 20 years old at that time. And so it's not something that was new way back then. But to many people today, it's brand new. It's like new thinking. It's like, oh, somebody was, you know, woken up from their Rip Van Winkle sleep. And then there's performance orientation. But it is rare. And so one of the things that I, what I hope to do with what I've been doing in my career and my sharing and working out loud and blah, 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 writing articles and doing videos and such is to help people gain that performance orientation so they can adopt what they can and adapt the rest. I have my methods and my approach to this thing. I've been an external consultant since 82. I've borrowed things from many people and either borrowed them as is or I've made modified them to fit my need. And I think everybody should, you know, think like that and do that. Borrow from the best and use it as is or modify it to meet your needs, your context. And so there's so there's a huge issue um, in the profession. And those people that have a performance orientation have a strategic advantage because they will always produce better content, better instructional, better learning content. And the other thing I learned on day one was what used to be called guidance or job aids and nowadays performance support. We should give people a job aid rather than force them to train. Most jobs can be done by referring to some short and sweet little guidance that says step one, do this, step two, do this, step three, do this. You do not have to commit this to memory. You do it often enough, you will commit it to memory. But most of a most Jobs don't require people to memorize everything, and that's a mistake that training and development, learning and development professionals make. They try to force people to memorize everything. When they go back to the job, it's not required that they memorized everything on demand in an instant, be able to do it. No, you can, if you can look something up and take that as guidance and then do your job. So 
I, but but what happened to us back in 1979 is that my my new boss and peer said, "Oh, we're going to do job aids. We're not going to do training because they knew this back in 1979." And but our clients then we were all new to the organization. Our clients hated it. They wanted training. They wanted traditional training. They knew what traditional training looked like. It looked like things that they learned in school when they were in school. It looked like education to them. But but that's what they wanted. And and so what we did is what I call sneaky trick number 47. We took the job aids, the performance support, and we embedded it in training so that people that had, took the training could take the job aid and use it on the job. And, and, they, and when they were quizzed or tested, they got to use the job aid in during the test. It was like an open book test. Um, shifting gears now to you, your training teachers and administrators to be better at what they do. So teachers perform tasks, employ behaviors situationally. Sometimes they're like good cop, bad cop, good teacher, bad teacher, uh, very warm and loving, sometimes harsh, depending on the situation, you, you use what you need to to get the job done. And, um, but they are there to produce an output and there's a chain of outputs. They produce lesson plans, they produce content, they deliver the content, uh, then they can, uh, and students intake that and then do quizzes and tests and things like that to see if they've gotten what they needed to. So you can kind of model and map out what does a teacher do? You know, what, what, how do they start? You know, they're given a class to teach and they got to figure it out, figure out what the materials are, what, what, what do you do on day one, day two, day three, et cetera, et cetera. And how will you know whether the teacher, whether people learn? So there's a whole philosophy that could be embraced there where you begin with the end in mind. You say, I want them to know X, Y, and Z or Z, and you can create the test and you can decide, okay, here's uh, how, and then you could do backward design and development and you can back out from that test. Here's what I'll teach them at the very end. Here's what I'll teach them before. Here's what I'll teach them before that. Here's what I'll teach them on day one. And you can organize the instructional flow so that people will learn things and you can decide where you're going to quiz them at midpoints to check in and see if everybody's tracking with what they should be learning. And then you can do remedial stuff, but that can be all done. Same thing with administrators. Administrators are produce, are doing tasks to produce outputs. So whether they can tell you these are the tasks that I'm doing or this is the output I produce, you can start with either of those and figure it all out. So if they, you know, I've been doing analysis with groups of people for 40 some years. And what I learned is that most people don't think about the outputs they produce. They can think about the things that they do, but they, so those are the means to the ends of producing an output. So if you ask them, so what do you do? They'll say, well, I do this and I do that and I do this and do that. And then I write it up as a report. Oh, so that report is the output. And they go, oh, I guess so. Um, so that's the, trick with those of us in the learning and development profession is that we've got to figure out what's the performance. And if I understand the outputs and how I can tell a good one from a bad one, what are the measures, who are the stakeholders that establish those measures, then I can figure out what are the tasks, what do you have to do in sequence, what can you do, you know, you need to do A, B, C, and then you can do D, one, two, three, or four in any order that you want, and then you can do E. So there's some sequencing, strict sequencing, and some loose and flexible sequencing in people's work processes, their task performance, that leads to that output. And then what's tricky about that also is that there are behavioral tasks that we can see, we can observe, we can count, we can measure. And then there's the cognitive tasks, the thinking that is damn difficult to get from people. Um, 70% of decision-making in, from of experts and really everybody, you and me and everybody, is non-conscious. We've automated that knowledge. We don't even know. I can't tell you. I can do the work. I can't tell you what I'm thinking. It, but if you ask me, my ego demands that I give you an answer because I'm an expert. So I mean, I've got to give you an answer. So I'll tell you something, but it ne won't necessarily be true. And even if it were true, it'd be partial. So I can give you about 30% of what I really know. Now, 
on the if I tell you the behavioral things that you can see and observe, if I were to tell you that, I'm going to miss up to 35% of that because I've automated that too. So I forget all the little steps that I do. Um, so when we interview experts, subject matter experts is what some people like to call them. I like to call them master performers um, and try to understand, you know, what do we teach people? What do they do? What do they produce? I go into all those situations knowing that I may get accurate data. I may get appropriate data but it's most likely going to be incomplete. And that behooves me then to work with more than one expert to figure out how do I get this as complete as possible? And when I'm creating content, I better test it and test it and test it and test it because I know darn well that every time I test it, I'm going to get more because it was incomplete to start with. And I need to be open with it. I need to be probing. I need to elicit what's missing from people. And forcing them to think about it, and they might go, oh, in between tasks two and three, there's actually two more tasks you're missing, and add those to that. And I need to be open to that, that it's good, that's just how it is because of the non-conscious nature of knowledge. Um, and so those are, that's what's tricky about our business. Most people don't have a performance orientation. They, they talk to one subject matter expert or one expert, and they take from that person and since they don't know what the application is, SMEs, subject matter experts, tend to overgive. They'll tell you everything that they know as best they can, just in case. And their egos demand that they go, oh, yeah, I know a lot here. Let me give it to you all. Where the learner who's beginning climbing the learning curve doesn't need all of that. And we, we instructional designer types, learning experience designer types, we don't know how to sort the wheat from the chaff and say, this is critical. This is needed to know early on. This other stuff, you can learn that later on in the intermediate level or advanced level of learning how to perform. And so when we don't have a performance orientation of the tasks and the outputs, we cannot challenge the expert that gives us too much content. We can't say on that third item that you've given me, can you show me where in the task process you absolutely need to know that? If I don't have that anchor of performance, I can't sort the content that somebody might give me. I don't know, so I have to include it. And therefore, we include all sorts of unnecessary stuff leading to cognitive overload to the point to where people can't learn anymore because we filled their heads and they haven't absorbed it and processed it and <laughs> internalized it. And so we just dump more and more content on them, hoping and praying that more is better, more is good, when in fact, less is better, less is good, the bare minimum. So in my approach to instructional design, after I've done my analysis, is that, to simplify it, I give people information, demonstration, and application, practice with feedback. And I start off by deciding based on my performance, my analysis data, what's the application? What would practice and feedback look like? Start with that. And then I can define that. And then I can say, so what do I need to demonstrate before the application exercise? Because that's the hands-on part. That's what I want to spend most of my time on. So if I'm going to put people in a practice exercise, shouldn't I show that to them, what it looks like end-to-end -end, so they are not clueless, but clued in? And so that's an advanced organizer for them about the practice exercise. So if I say, okay, here's the practice exercise, here's the quick demonstration of what that looks like, then what's the minimum information I need to give people so that they know enough, so the demonstration makes sense to them, and then they can perform in the application exercise. And if they do the application exercise, the practice with feedback, we can give them feedback that reinforces what they did right and corrective feedback that reshapes what they will do the next time because too often we give people practice one time it's one and done if you didn't get it too bad for you well my model and i would tell clients this in meetings i'd say even before i did the analysis before i got in design before i developed it or anything i'd be telling them on day one I, 60 70 percent of this is going to be hands-on uh application exercises practice with feedback um and i'm going to do four levels of practice, if I can. You might stop me, because it's gonna take a lot of time, 
and you guys don't like that, but that's what I'm going to do. So you're going to stop me, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm going to design it that way. And then you can pull it out if you don't want to. Well, the first exercise is what I call easy peasy because we're, you know, getting people into the shallow end of the pool, so to speak, and letting them, you know, we're not trying to scare them and throw them in the deep end. We're trying to ease them into it. The second one will be difficult. The third practice with feedback will be darn difficult, or if I can say this, damn difficult. The fourth exercise is going to be from Hades or from hell. It's going to be hellacious. We're going to put them through the stress test. This is the worst it can be out there in your job. And so let's let's prepare you for that. Because if you're going to fight fires for a living, you don't do this by some easy peasy exercise. You go in there where it's hot and you're sweating and, and, this, and there's flames around you and there's danger all around you. We need to prepare people for that if that's part of the job. Not every task and output involves such things, but where that's necessary, that's what I'm going to do, I would tell my clients. And then I go, oh, we'll see about that. And then I do the analysis, do the design and show them on this thing here, information, demonstration, no practice with feedback because that's so damn simple. Why would we put people waste their time practicing something that's so simple? One, two, three, A, B, C. This next thing, information, demonstration, application exercise, application exercise, application exercise, and then the one from Hades, or if you prefer, from hell. And that's what we're going to use to prepare people so that they have competence and confidence to go back out on the job. Now, that's my spiel. I've been seeing these things a lot. That's why it comes so easily to me. Um, but that's kind of the philosophy and the roots of it go back to uh, the late Gary Rumler, the late Tom Gilbert, the late Joe Harless, the late Bob Mager, all big names in the field here in America, less known uh, in, in Europe, um, other than maybe Bob Mager, but but even uh, he may not be as well known. But but so there's a long history of people who promoted this thing, wrote books about this, did conference presentations, had workshops available all over North America way back then. And I was lucky that I got oriented to that and I, I became a true believer. Um, I drank the Kool-Aid as we joke about that, uh, unfortunately. Um, but so that's kind of what, what I do, what I've been doing my entire career. Um, and now I'm on a mission kind of to share that with others so that hopefully they, um, the, Tom Gilbert wrote a book in 1978 called Human Competence. And then he complained about the cult of behaviors. He saw too much training back then that was about behaviors without the output, what he called accomplishment. People were being taught to behave a certain way as if that was the means and the ends. Well, behaviors are means to an end. And so what's the end? And we got to train people on how to behave situationally to produce an output. And so he he, joke, he didn't joke about it, but he called it the cult of behaviors. So lately I've been calling it the cult of performance. I don't want people to learn just behaviors, the means to an end. I don't want them to learn just knowledge and skills, which are means to the end. I don't want them to learn how to do tasks unless that task leads to the ends of an output. And there's a difference between outputs and the outcomes. If I produced uh, an output and gave it to you and met the requirements, you, my customer, would be happy. That's an outcome. But I can't practice making you happy, but I can practice producing that output that should you receive it would make you happy, would make the regulators happy, would make the, the owners of the company happy because I made money, didn't lose money when I produced an output for you. You know, we sold you something for $10 and it cost us 12. We lost money on it. So the owners aren't happy with that. You might be happy. Your outcome is fine. The regulators, they might be fine because they don't care if we go broke or not. But the owners of the company, they might be concerned with the fact that we're selling at a loss. And so that's why we need to understand all of the stakeholders, what all of their requirements are for the performance in total, which is really when you produce that output, but also for the task performance. Because 
we could produce an output. Everybody loves the output. All the stakeholders with the output are happy, but we broke the child labor laws in our process. So we've got some regulators who are unhappy. We may have owners who didn't want us to do that. You know, it's like uh, uh, modern day slavery. We may have used people who were forced to perform in our process and we didn't know that they are modern day slaves. Um, and so we need to understand the totality of our performance. We need to understand who all, what are all the requirements for the end output and the process. And we need to train people to go into a performance context, a situation and perform and understand what are the barriers to performance? How can I anticipate them and avoid them? And what do I do if they are unavoidable? Um, and we may not give that to somebody the first time we teach them how to do something. We may say, okay, do learn to do it. And then in the as we progress people through more and more difficult application exercises, we might begin to add some of these, those kinds of variances. Um, so people are prepared for the real world, the authentic world that they were going to work in. Our, our instruction, our training, our learning needs to reflect that real world. And we need to help people memorize things when they're needed, when they need a performance response that's memorized on the job. And we need to give them reference materials, performance support, job aids, called many different things. We need to give them those things when the performance context allows for a reference performance response. And most people don't think like this. And, but these are the messages and the lessons learned from decades ago. And it's a darn shame that this isn't more well known and embraced, but it requires a different approach in learning and development organizations. And uh, on my, while I'm on my soapbox here, I'll say that the individual contributor practitioners are not to blame for this not happening, for them not embracing them, for them not doing it this way. It's their leadership that is deficient. Their leadership either doesn't know well enough or they don't know how to put something in place so that the processes that their people work in and the products that they produce fit this kind of a model. Uh, too often, L&D leadership, everybody's thinking about it, the leadership and the leadership of an enterprise is thinking about an education model where we tell people things and we see if they can memorize them and answer the quiz questions and the test questions later on. They don't think about the enterprise learning differently than they do educational learning. And there's a time and a place for, for them both. And the educational world can adapt a lot of the things that are best practices, if you will, from the enterprise learning to be for, more focused on What's the minimum information to get people before we have drill and practice where they internalize this and memorize this? Because there's certain thing in, in math or maths where you need to know this before you can do the next level and the next level and the next level. So there are there is a chain of things to be learned and to be memorized or to be able to look at and you, how to use a calculator if you don't need to know all the equations. You know, but the, the fact that there is a, an algorithm in a calculator that you can use to figure this out and you just need to plug in the variables. So there's all sorts of things that I think that can be borrowed from the better practices of enterprise learning and adopted in the enterprise learning world. One of the big issues, and I heard this from other people, so this is not my own uh, uh, discovery is that there's so much churn in our field of new practitioners coming in and leadership. There's no stability there where people can do this. So leaders don't know how to sell a performance-based training, performance-based instruction, performance-based learning experience approach. They don't know how to sell performance support and job aids versus training. They, they don't they don't know how to do that. Now, I'm overgeneralizing here because there are people who do. I worked with a guy at Motorola in 1981, Bill Wigginhorn, who was then the, the leader of Motorola University. He was there for 20-some years. 
Um, he got that. He knew that. He brought in people to influence his new staff back in 1981 um, that could influence us with how to go about and do this, how to do it in a, with the performance orientation. Um, and there are others too, but they are the rare ones. Now, I've had 80 some clients as a consultant um, and my clients liked what I did because I talked not learning jargon or training jargon. I talked about business and processes and outputs. Um, and not everybody talks about uh, things like that, but my clients in, in particular did. And so they appreciated that looking at what it is we were trying to affect, not how we were going to affect it. That was secondary. That's a means to the ends of what is this performance and how do we get people to perform better and faster and cheaper? And so I was lucky that I, in, in 81 and 82, when I was at Motorola, I got exposed to a lot of the quality uh, stuff, the total quality management movement, the Deming, Duran, and a bunch of other uh, uh, gurus at the time and their approaches and their thinking. And, you know, people work in processes. The quality world is focused on the processes. And we learning and development, training and development people, we're focused on the people in those processes. And there's a lot of, lessons to be learned about total quality management movement and uh, leaning process. So the whole lean movement, Motorola invented Six Sigma to reduce variation. But the people at Motorola, before Motorola invented Six Sigma, which was after I left, um, the quality gurus that were involved in the invention of Six Sigma that I had interviewed as part of my uh, tasks they would tell me before this was known as total quality management, a guy, it was known as VR, variability reduction. And we were always trying to reduce the variability in the process so we could reduce the variation in the product. And, you know, you can't reduce the variation in a product without reducing the variation in the process. That's just how it is. And so I th that fits so well with my performance orientation, having a process orientation that now I really usually team up the word process and performance, process going first, performance going next, because that's what we're trying to affect. And we need to understand people are working in a process and in, in an environment and do that, use that systems thinking to understand all of that and the variations that people are working with, um, especially in today's world, uh, um, um, the, the, um, People that aren't doing rote tasks, they have to do more, they have to be more robust because the requirements change, the situation changes, and they've got to flex with all that. And that sometimes is difficult for people in learning and development to figure out, well, what's the core? And then how does it vary? They just see the variation and they can't boil it down to the simplicity of, even our ADDIE model in learning and development analysis then leads to design, then leads to development, then leads to implementing it. And then you can finally evaluate it. Well, you could evaluate it all along. Mm -hmm. uh, analysis, you do the analysis all along here. Um, if you did project planning uh, before you did analysis, you'd be doing project planning and management all the way along. So we tend to uh, not be able to boil things down into simple kind of a block diagram and understanding that that is a false view of it. Uh, design happens during analysis and in development. Analysis happens in all the phases. Uh, so we try to create simple models and then it conveys simplicity, which isn't true. But it's hard to show a complex model without losing people because they can't figure it out. Um, and, and so... You know, we're challenged that way, but so our clients don't understand this. Our, our leadership don't often understand this. It takes work. It takes a good process and it takes people climbing the learning and performance curves to learn how to do this performance orientation. It doesn't take necessarily a lot longer. It may take a little bit longer than the way you're doing things now, which is focused on topics generating a whole bunch of content. And then somebody tells you, well, that's too much, skinny it down. You got four hours, we need two hours. And there's no way to uh, logically reduce that content. You can't tell what's 
required and what's extraneous. Nice to know stuff we used to call it versus need to know. If you're if you're not focused on performance, there's no way that you can decide what's really need to know because that's arbitrary, your opinion versus mine. Because we can't look at performance and go, hey, you really don't need to know that. You know, if you're an expert and you're dealing with the problem that happens every 42 years, yeah, you'll need to know that. But new people, they don't need to know that to start with. So that's extraneous. It just gets in the way. Um, but, you know, they're, they're, they're in, you know, lies the challenges for the practitioner, their leaders, and the clients that we serve. Because we all think about the common experience that we have. It's the only shared experience that we all have is that we went through the education system. And even though there's variations on that, there's all pretty similar. We're taught stuff. We learn to regurgitate it in quizzes and tests or, you know, in exchange with the teacher. And that's the model that too many people see and use. And they don't see that it really needs to be different. It can be very different. Um, and it can be much more effective. You know, the, the sloppy way we do learning, you know, I, I learn something in a, in a formal training class and it's not complete. And so when I go back to the job, because I learned something that was incomplete, I have to go into informal learning and social learning to figure out, you know, what's missing, how to make this work. It's not really working for me. So I ask my neighbor, social learning, or I do trial and error, try to figure it out, informal learning. And while that might be eventually effective, it certainly isn't efficient. And if we could, if we could approach instruction and learning like engineers do, rather than as an artist colony might, if we had prescribed processes that were rigorous where required and flexible where feasible, then we would be able to produce more consistent content that had an impact that transferred to the job because it was authentic. It's really what they needed to know, nothing more, nothing less. And it would have an impact on performance because that's what we were oriented to in the first place. If, if you have an opportunity to demonstrate an approach that actually does transfer because it was authentic and does have an impact on performance because that's what it was targeting from the very get-go, then more clients would like to have more of that because that's what they want. Um, but it takes getting in there and finding an opportunity, forcing yourself into an opportunity where you can demonstrate a different approach to this. And if you don't get stopped by your own leadership or the client, because that's going to take longer, that looks different than how we normally do it around here. Um, that's going to cost more money. What do you mean? You need to talk to five SMEs. I want you to talk to one. Isn't that sufficient? You know, if you get over the hurdles, the barriers that have been put in place by our clients and our leaders, then we could be more successful and have a demonstration case to, uh, to, to show people what can be achieved. I, I had a major project with General Motors in, uh, from 95 to 2000. And at one point, they decided they needed to do a video of testimonials of their clients. This was General Motors University. They interviewed product managers and engineers who had been through our process, who all said something along these lines. Damn, it was a difficult process. I never thought we'd get through it, but I'm glad we did because it had such a different impact on this. And I believe in it now. I was a resistor to start with, but I came around. And so which is the video that they wanted to put together because they wanted to show a video to the other people that they were going to serve. And rather than deal with all that resistance, they thought if they showed this video of some people who were well known throughout General Motors as being true skeptics, they, and we turned them around, maybe other people would be more receptive to how we wanted to do business with them. And I thought it was, it was a very interesting experiment and it did work until new leadership came in at the top of General Motors and they threw all the current vendors out. And this person from the outside brought in all their favorite vendors from their prior company. Uh, so that kind of stuff happens too. So all the good work that we did kind of was for naught at the, at the very end of it all. Well, that's, that is the, uh, that's the $64 million question <laughs> it is. Over here on this, this side of the pond. 
But um, yeah, so it's really looking for somebody who's receptive, somebody who's uh, a client who wasn't satisfied with how things have gone in the past in a learning and development project, and they're open for something new. So you need to find some sort of a champion who will allow you to do this. And you'll need to explain carefully how the, how, how you're going to do it, how what's different, what the advantages are of doing it this way. How doing something differently on the front end leads to something in the middle and at the end that's different. And you need to speak in their language, not in training and learning and jargon, but you need to think about what is it that they do and uh, relate it all to their own processes because they have processes, they produce outputs. We're going to produce, a, we're going to use a process, we're going to produce an output. Ours is a learning product, learning content, whether it's performance support or a learning experience. They do similar things here. We need to relate to them about how you do things in a more logical, rational fashion rather than just random, you know, whatever, whenever, however, um, and, and find somebody who's willing to do that. And then if you can do that and have success, then you have some, a story to tell and uh, somebody from inside a company, but if you're a consultant going from company to company to company, you it's harder to do. If you're an internal consultant and you do that, then the word can spread inside your company and people will have heard the story and they'll be learn to trust you and maybe take a chance doing it differently to have a better result. Um, but when you're a consultant, an external consultant going from company to company to company, you have to earn that privilege to do things differently each and every time, which involves a quite a bit of salesmanship up front, figuring out who they are, what their language is, what can you tell them that they can relate to? Because otherwise it's just a bunch of learning and development, mumbo jumbo, jargon, cognitive load. I mean, you know, you know, and that just turns them off. And so, you know, I say that uh, you got to save your uh, L&D jargon for your conferences and for your professional networks, but don't talk to your customers with any of that. Thank you.